So a little bit of history, there was some early support for the official story from uh, so-called experts who said that jet fuel fires had melted the steel. The uh, BBC Scientific American, uh, Nova Video, a couple of professors from major universities, all told us that the jet fuel fires melted the steel. At first we were told that the heat of the fires had softened and melted the structure of the building. In 2002, Nova depicted a scenario envisioned by many experts at the time, that the truss connections failed in the extreme heat, causing the floors to fall onto one another, precipitating the collapse. As the steel began to soften and melt, the interior core columns began to give. Then you had this sequential failure that took place where it all pancaked one after the other. Some other major media sources talked about temperatures which were very high. And as far as I know, none of these people have apologized to us. But just to get this out of the way, steel melts at approximately 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. And jet fuel fires burn in the maximum of approximately 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit unless in a special combustion chamber. And even at that, just a few hundred degrees higher than that. The staff engineers, scientists that contributed to the NIST report had some good information. And... Uh, and, and they show that the, the jet fuel, for, for a few moments, it was, it was a hotter fire than, than would normally be experienced in the standard time temperature curve for, for fires. But that, that quickly dissipated, and, and the overall effect of this jet fuel in, in the total duration of, say, uh, zero to one hour or just before the buildings collapsed was relatively insignificant. The difference, maybe it was five or ten percent more BTUs in, in the whole floor area. But but that's in the whole scheme of things it's 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 insignificant because the fire loading could be increased by a factor of ten and, and this this still wouldn't it wouldn't have been a been a difference uh, as far as the building surviving. Uh, the building has a huge thermal mass, and uh, the energy of the fire is really not that uh, great compared to the thermal mass of the building. It just takes a huge amount of energy to heat all that steel and concrete up. And, and if you look at it, step back and, and, and look at uh, what was going on, the effect of the jet fuel was, uh, was relatively uh, short-lived, few, few, few minutes, and... And then it was, uh, it, it didn't add anything extra to a normal fire. You don't need to melt the steel columns, you just need to start weakening them. What we found is it doesn't take temperatures high enough to melt steel, it just has to heat up the steel so it expands and then softens and weakens the structure until it collapses. In their computer simulation, NIST claims to have observed temperatures beyond 1,800 degrees during the fires. It's important to remember that gas temperatures are not steel temperatures. Steel temperatures in a fire actually lag behind in time and in magnitude of the temperature uh, from gas temperatures. The media portrayed the, these fires as being extremely hot, but in, in going into the NIST reports with a licensed chemical engineer who, who normalized all the, uh, the data, the fires were not that hot. In, in World Trade Center 1 and 2. And if, if, if you look at the NIST zone data, you could see this. And, and to, uh, 
to to use our own powers of observation, you could tell by by seeing these fires, seeing black smoke come out the windows, that means that the the fires were oxygen starved. So the heat did not reach the the temperatures that it could have reached if all this black soot actually burned. The the fuel... uh, just sort of gave up heat to to vaporize uh, some of these constituents into black smoke, and it was incomplete uh, combustion, and so it was a low temperature fire. But in other other high rise fires where there was vertical openings, broken windows, there was a free flow of oxygen in, and and these fires exhibited uh, a whiter. Um, smoke plume, very, very little uh, dark carbon, because it was more complete combustion, much hotter. So like, for instance, the uh, the first interstate bank building in Los Angeles, California, that was uh, quite a robust uh, building because it was built in a, in a seismic area. But it had insufficient um, blockage to prevent the uh, vertical spread of fires, and that fire burned for four hours. Very hot fire. But at the end, there was no structural damage. How hot could the steel have become? That's important to their story, that the columns were softened, the floors were softened. NIST actually says a number of things. FEMA said there were 4,000 gallons of jet fuel available. FEMA says there was half of what was uh, impacted the plane, uh, impacted the buildings. We'll call it 4,500 gallons. This would have provided a certain amount of energy. They didn't do this calculation, by the way. The office furnishings were known. The the fire load was known. Would have provided a certain amount of energy. And using the masses and specific heats for the materials heated the maximum temperature, the temperature of the steel and the concrete, could have been calculated, and the result is less than 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's making a lot of assumptions that favor the official story. And I'm sorry this is very technical and tedious, but (laughs) this is actually assuming a lot of things, and so we'll have to kind of do another assumption and, and say that this is probably the maximum temperature that the steel saw, and this does match up well with the paint test. So let's take a look at the steel temperatures we've discussed so far. On the far left is the 480 degree value that the paint test showed that less than 2% of the steel samples saw this temperature. That's very informative. The calculation is a bit above that. That matches well. Steel at half strength is quite a bit higher than that. In the second test NIST did, we know none of the steel samples reached that temperature. The point at which steel is forged or softened Uh, in order for uh, forming into other uh, shapes is quite a bit higher than that. And the ASTM E119 test is done at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit and so on. So the point here is that the temperatures that we have knowledge about are way too low to have softened or melted any kind of steel. Even unfireproof steel just can't happen. The truth is that NIST itself admitted in their own report to have no proof for temperatures high enough to seriously weaken steel. From the NIST report we read, of the more than 170 areas examined on 16 perimeter column panels, only three columns had evidence that the steel reached temperatures above 250 degrees centigrade or 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Only two core column specimens had sufficient paint remaining to make such an analysis, and the temperatures did not reach 200 150 degrees centigrade. No conclusive evidence was found to indicate that pre-collapse fires were severe enough to have a significant effect on the microstructure that would have resulted in weakening of the steel structure. In other words, NIST openly admits to have no proof to support their own theory. In conclusion, the known facts are steel melts at about 2800 degrees Fahrenheit. Softening can begin at about 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Except for three isolated spots, NIST admits to have found no proof of temperatures beyond 480 degrees Fahrenheit, which is less than half the temperatures needed to seriously weaken steel.